The subject of lasers gets examined really commonly in the FRCA and given, unless you're doing laser lists really frequently, you won't come across them a whole lot in your anesthetic practice, but they get examined very, very frequently. So it's really useful if you've got a good baseline knowledge. So we're just gonna go through all the key things that come up in the exam, just the really high yield questions that you need to know about. So first of all, what does laser stand for? So it stand, it's an acronym and it stands for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. What does this mean? So light is a form of radiation of energy, usually in the form of photons, and it could be particles or waves. That whole argument is way beyond what we need for the exam. All you need to know is that laser light is a special form of light radiation, and it's produced in a specific way to give three properties. It is monochromatic, which means it has one wavelength. It's all one color, and you can tell that when you have a laser pointer, it's all one color. There's no mixture of light there. It's collimated, which means all the light beams are very parallel. And you can see that with a laser pointer is it produces a very small point on the wall because it's a very thin, very narrow beam of parallel light. It's not spreading out like a torch. It's all in one direction. It's collimated. All the light beams are parallel. And the last thing is they are coherent, which is a weird concept. But if you imagine all those wavelengths, it basically just means all those waves are aligned with each other. So if you drew a picture of those waves, the peaks and the troughs would all line up with each other. And those are the three you need to know. Monochromatic, coherent, and collimated. Cool, then you get asked, what are the components of a laser? So you've got three things that you need to be able to talk about. You need a lasing medium. So this is the substance within the laser that's producing the laser light. You need an optical resonator. That refers to the box that the lasing medium is contained within. And you need an energy source. And what happens is you fire an energy source at your lasing medium and through the process of lasing, which we'll talk about in a minute, you end up producing a characteristic wavelength of light and it all bounces around inside the optical resonator, which makes sense. It's bouncing light, it's resonating back and forth. And then at the other end, it has a little hole and that light is allowed to escape in one direction through that hole. And that's how you produce your thin beam of parallel collimated monochromatic light. Now, a lasing medium can be solid, liquid or gas. And you need to be able to list some examples. So some gas could be argon or CO2, your liquid. So there's yellow liquid dye. You don't use it very much, but it's one of the options. And a solid would be something like ruby, which produces a red laser. So how does a laser work? You just need to be able to explain the steps. Um, even if you don't fully understand it, as long as you can say the main steps, you'll get all the marks in the exam. So first of all, you say energy is supplied to a lasing medium, and usually that's in the form of a flash of light or in the form of a voltage. That's generally how energy is supplied to the lasing medium. And this is a process called pumping. So you're just pumping energy into this gas or this solid or this liquid. And what happens is when you fire energy at your lasing medium, within that medium, electrons get lifted up an energy level. So they receive energy, that energy allows them to jump up an energy level. And then what happens is they drop back down and in that process they release energy. So this is that stimulated emission of radiation that we talked about. We have stimulated the electron to move up an energy level, it then drops down and releases energy in the form of another photon. And that photon can go on and affect another electron. And so you've got this resonator with all these photons bouncing around inside, energizing each other and then dropping back down again. This is the process of lasing. And a substance or the medium is said to laze when there are more electrons in the higher state than the lower state energy. And you've got this sort of positive feedback where they're all exciting each other. And this all happens very quickly, as you might imagine. And then once you've reached that state where it has lased, you can release all that light and that's your laser light. So then they might ask you what different lasing media are used for. It's unlikely you're going to need to know all of these, but to be able to recite a couple or give a couple of examples, say in the SOE answer would be really valuable. So we'll start with ruby is used for tattoo removal. So I remember a tattoo of a ruby uh, and it's used for removing the tattoo. So it's a red laser and rubies are red. So that's usually fairly easy to remember. I remember a tattoo of a ruby, it's tattoo removal. How you remember 694 is up to you, but that's the wavelength that we're talking about. CO2 is a common, more commonly used, and this is used for superficial surgery. So like things like airway surgery, but it's got very poor tissue penetration. So it's good for superficial surgery. Okay. Now, rather than the 694 nanometers of Ruby's laser light, CO2 has a wavelength of 10,600 nanometers, which means it's in the infrared, and we say it's the far infrared spectrum. So it's an infrared laser, which means you can't see it even though it's firing out that radiation. The other commonly examined one is the ND YAG. Now this stands for neodymium doped yttrium aluminium garnet. Don't ask me why those are the words we use, 
that's just what you need to be able to remember, ND YAG. Now, this is another infrared laser, but instead of 10,600 nanometers, it's 1,060. So just lop a zero off and you go from CO2 to ND YAG. And because that wavelength is much, much smaller, it's still infrared, but we say it's near infrared rather than far. Now, this has much better tissue penetration. We're still only talking two to six millimeters, but it's better than the CO2 laser. And it's used for, it's, it's what we use for airway surgery and it's used for cutting and coagulopathy. It's also used in endoscopy, but mainly that's what you will see for airway surgery. Argon is a blue-green laser. The wavelength is 480 to 500 nanometers, and it's used for retinal surgery. And yellow pulsed dye is a liquid lasing medium. It produces 390 to 640 nanometers, and this is used for dermatology. Uh, things like birthmark removal, vascular lesions, that kind of thing. So those are the only ones you really need to know. Ruby, CO2, NDAG, argon and then liquid yellow if you can remember all of those it's wonderful if you can just recognize them that's helpful for things like the written exam paper um, but if you can mention them and just be aware of them that will get you extra marks in the exam so the most important thing for an anesthetist we're not generally the ones using the laser but we have to deal with the problems that arise so we get asked what are the safety concerns associated with using lasers so lasers are firing out very dense energy even though light isn't necessarily particularly large quantities of energy it's very, very focused. So you get a lot of heat density and that's how it burns and coagulates tissue. So you can imagine that can also cause problems. So the main concern with lasers is the possibility of them causing burns. And that can be to the tissues that you're aiming them at, but particularly we worry about people's eyes because it can damage the retina. Now, the, the risk of retinal damage depends on two things. One, how powerful the laser is, because obviously if you've got a really powerful one, it's gonna cause more damage more quickly, but also whether they stimulate the blink reflex. So lasers in you know commonly used products, CD players, that kind of thing, and laser pointers, often they will stimulate the blink reflex. And if they do, that's protective. But if they don't, that's damaging because you can do damage with to the retina and there's nothing stopping it, there's nothing getting in the way. So they are rated from one to four. So one would be your CD player, safe, stimulates the blink reflex, not much energy and four would be your medical ones don't stimulate the blink reflex and lots of energy they're the most dangerous so we have to take appropriate precautions when we're using them so we don't harm patients or staff so when we're asked about what the safety considerations are we break it down into patient and staff so for the staff it's they wear you wear laser safe goggles so even if the laser does fire at your eye your eyes are protected you block all the windows, you block all the doors, you put warning signs out, you have a dedicated laser theater, minimize reflective surfaces, so don't have loads of shiny equipment about that mean if you fire the laser at it by accident, it might bounce off and hit someone in the eye who might not be wearing goggles. The other thing is they can cause fires, so you need to have fire extinguishers or saline or both available. And then for the patient, we need to make sure that we're using the beam only when necessary, so you're not just pointing and shooting all the time, you're only using it when you need it. And when you are aiming it, you have it on very low power and then you're only firing on high intensity when you really need it, when you're pointing at the right thing. You need to make sure you are not filling their airway with oxygen and then lighting a fire in it because that will cause an airway fire. So you want them on the lowest FiO2 that you can get away with and you're aiming for less than 30% oxygen. The patient needs eye protection as well and you want lots of wet swabs available to protect the tissues surrounding where you're lasing. So you want the bit that you're trying to target, that needs to be exposed, but you can protect the surrounding tissues with wet swabs as well. Now obviously it's gonna differ between something like a urological laser where the laser is inside the patient versus an airway laser where it's sort of in the mouth and actually it could reasonably fire out into the, uh, into the room. So there's different levels of risk. The patient probably doesn't need to wear goggles if the laser is inside their ureter but many places will still institute it as a generic laser safe policy. So it'll depend on where you're working. Really common OSCE question is looking at a laser safe tube and being asked what it is and what its features are. And there's four things to be aware of for a laser safe tube. The first is it's got a stainless steel flexible spiral. And the idea is this protects the tube itself from the laser. So you're not gonna melt it or burn it. It also helps make it stronger, prevent it from kinking a bit like a, fle a normal flexi tube. It's also matte on the outside so it disperses the beam rather than reflecting it and focusing it on another bit of tissue. Second point is it's a non-combustible tube. You can't really set fire to it, which is always a positive thing for airway equipment. It's very easy to sterilize. It's inert in human tissue. Those are sort of generic things. And the last thing is many of them will have twin cups. And that's how you spot a laser safe tube is it's got this metal spiral and then two cups. And the idea is that you have both of them inflated 
And then if you lose one of them, the other one's still there. If you punctured one with the laser by accident, the other one's still there to work. And you can fill the cuffs with dye or with saline rather than with air. And that makes it much easier to uh, establish whether there's damage to the cuff or not. And finally, last thing is what do you do if there is an airway fire? So this is a standard resus, SOE or OSCE question that comes up. And there it's just you just got to know the steps. First thing, obviously, turn off the laser. Second thing, call for help, skilled assistance, whatever you want to say. Thirdly, turn down the oxygen. Now, this is probably the only emergency in anaesthetics where you turn the oxygen down. Every other time you whack it to 100%, this time, turn it down. Go to room air if you can. The idea is you do not want to encourage a fire. And if you can get away with it, you also want to stop ventilating the patient. You want to remove the burnt tube, flood the area with saline, cool it down, put the fire out. Then, face mask ventilate the patient. If you need to give them oxygen, you need to give them oxygen, but you're trying to give as little as possible. Then you want to re-intubate them as soon as possible. And once you've got that definitive airway, you then want to do bronchoscopy so that you can assess the damage done. So it's turn off the laser, call for help, turn down the oxygen, ideally switch off ventilation, flood the area with saline and remove the burnt tube, face mask ventilate, re intubate bronchoscopy. And those are your steps. And that's pretty much everything you need to know about lasers. If you're interested in them, we have a whole post on anesthesia.com that you can go and read. You don't need any more detail than that. So if you're just trying to revise and get the points for the exam, those are the questions that tend to come up. And they're all covered in our primary FRCA toolkit, and you can find the link to that in the description below.